Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining Kind today on this Facebook Live. We're going to give people a few seconds to join. Um, and it looks like we are going. <laughs> so, hi, I am Alex Pender. I am Director of Digital Media here at Kids in Need of Defense. And today I'm joined with uh, Jen Podkel, our Vice President of Policy and Advocacy. And we really just wanted to take today to go through with you all uh, an overview of the migrant protection protocols. Um, it's been a year since this policy has been enacted. Um, so we wanted to get a debrief from Jen over what um, her and uh, the team has been seeing on the ground uh, about how this policy is affecting uh, Central American asylum seekers. Um, and we're, we also wanna take your questions from you all. So um, please comment uh, in the, or write your question in the comment box and we'll also be sharing some resources there as well. Um, so let's get started. So we keep hearing about, you know, this quote unquote remain in Mexico, um, MPP. Uh, could you really give our audience an overview of what these migrant protection protocols are and how they're affecting asylum seekers from Central America? Yeah, sure. So MPP, otherwise known as remain in Mexico, is a policy that the administration put forward. So it's not a new law, right? This is just a policy change. And what the administration did is they decided that instead of allowing people to come to the United States and ask for protection and have their case heard while they're here in the US, they were gonna be kind of registering people right at the ports of entry. So people who kind of are presenting themselves at bridges, at airports, um, asking for humanitarian protection, saying, that's fine, you're allowed to ask for protection. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make you turn around and go wait in Mexico until you can have your hearing before an immigration judge. So this policy was intended to really dissuade people from coming here and asking for protection. Um, it still allows people an opportunity to have their case heard by a judge, but they have to go sit and wait in Mexico for months on end until they can have their case heard. Now, of course, that puts them at risk of incredible danger. Uh, a lot of these people uh, don't have anywhere to go in Mexico. They don't have any resources. You know, these are some very, very desperate people who are forced to flee oftentimes at a moment's notice, really, from their home. They don't have anything. And they have to go sit and wait in Mexico for months while they wait um, for a judge to be able to hear their case. So they might not have access to an attorney um, or even information about what the process is like. Now, what's really, you know, has been fascinating is that when this policy is implemented, they said unaccompanied children, this will not apply to unaccompanied children, right? right? There's a federal law that says unaccompanied children, so kids who are on their own, are allowed to come to the United States and ask for protection, and they can go into the custody and care of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Mm -hmm. So when this policy first came out, I think a lot of us thought, phew, at least the kids are exempt. You know, this is a terrible policy, at least the kids are exempt. Unfortunately, Alex, what we've seen over the past year is that they're absolutely not exempt from this, right? Yeah. We are seeing kids who are getting caught up in this policy. We're seeing, you know, and we can talk about examples yeah. and, and exactly what we're seeing, but we're certainly seeing kids being impacted impacted in really terrible ways for this policy. So are kids even, when kids, an unaccompanied child makes it to the border, um, or it, I'm sorry, even to Mexico, how are they getting caught up in, in what's happening with this policy on the ground in Mexico? Yeah, sure. So there's, you know, there have been a lot of changes in how cases are being processed at the border. Sometimes you might encounter an officer or agent who doesn't understand all the rules with all the different policy right. changes that have been for asylum seekers at the border. Um, sometimes you have a kid who might walk up with a family member, but it's an extended family member, so grandparent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that child might be deemed unaccompanied, might be separated from that extended family member. Um, you know, and, and some of the most tragic cases that we're seeing is a kid goes and asks for protection with their parent, right? They're going as a family unit. So kids who weren't otherwise unaccompanied, who are accompanied kids, mm -hmm. they go to ask for protection. The border official turns them around, says that's fine, why don't you come back in three months from now? And they're living on the streets in Mexico, right? Because they don't mm -hmm. have any resources. They're living in these tents in Mexico. And something is happening while they're in Mexico and these kids are rendered unaccompanied. So we're hearing terrible stories of you know, violence being committed against mm -hmm. the parents parents disappearing. Um, you know, we heard one really terrible case where a girl said her mom, there were actually men harassing her and her mom. Her mom left her to go report this to the police, the Mexican officials, and mom never came back. 
So we don't know in a lot of cases what's happening, but children are being rendered unaccompanied because of the violence and uncertainty um, of these living conditions. Mm -hmm. And so then they're being you know, made aware of the officials at the border, and now they're unaccompanied children, so they're entering into the US and have the ability to ask for protection. But really what this is, it's like family separation 2.0. Right, the way families are being separated, it's just like what we saw a couple summers ago, although it's you know 200 yards on the other side right. of the border. But it's really U.S. policy, again, that's separating these kids. Right. And when they're in Mexico, you spoke a little bit about this at the beginning, um, and, and they're applying for asylum. What is that process like? You, you said there's no access to attorneys. So how are these families even taking the steps necessary to to ensure that they have everything in place to, to apply for asylum? I mean, a lot of them can't, right? A lot of them don't really understand. They have a piece of paper that's written in English that says, come back in a few months, mm -hmm. right? And how do you figure out how to make your claim? How do you yeah. tell your story? What sort of evidence are you gonna need? There's been amazing work done by our colleague organizations, by private attorneys flying down to the border, um, attorneys who work on the border who are going across every day to try to do outreach and education uh, to folks who are waiting, but it's simply not enough. I mean, there are thousands of people who are being put in this program, exposed to harm, and it's making it almost impossible for them to ask for protection. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like everything that we do here at KIND, you know, our position is everybody should have a fair opportunity to tell their story, right? We don't want people to be put in more harm by U.S. policies, mm -hmm. and we want everyone to at least have a fair chance to have their story heard, right? Mm -hmm. And PP is making that impossible, and what we're seeing with our clients who are being rendered unaccompanied by this program is that U.S. policy is continuing family separation mm -hmm. and continuing to make it very difficult, if not possible, for kids to have their protection claim heard, mm -hmm. right? And so, and, and I know that you yourself and um, a few of our other staff have been traveling to the border and to Mexico to kind of really take a pulse about what is happening. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little to those trips, um, what you saw on the ground, uh, and share some of the stories of the, the children and the families that you, you spoke with and got to interact with. Yeah, you know, what's really fascinating is having been at a couple different ports of entry and seeing this in different places, mm -hmm. As different as different places are, Arizona, California, Texas, mm -hmm. the scenes are exactly the same. I mean, you see these tent communities, people are living you know, in tents in very precarious facilities. You know, it's kind of like a refugee situation anywhere in the world, minus the resources that refugee camps right. offer, right? Refugee camps have, you know, kind of infrastructure and systems and, you know, at least some minimum standards um, of protection, right, for people yeah. who are living there. That just doesn't exist there, you know what I mean? We'll go, I mean, sometimes you want to bring stuff to people because they have absolutely nothing, you know, even just dry socks is something mm -hmm. that's really important to them because they're out in the elements. Um, but it's also just this waiting, this unknown of how long it's going to be, what's going to happen while people are waiting, um, and not having any sort of permanency or resolution to what they're going to do. It's just, you know, it's a frightening place. Um, you know, we see lots of sick kids, right? Kids are out in the elements, you know, days on end, um, often wet. They are not getting the kind of care and nutrition that they need. Um, you know, spending two days once down there, I came back so sick, right? And I was only there two days and I was not sleeping outside or anything, right? I was just talking to people in this camp. So it's just, I can't emphasize enough how dire the situation is. Um, you know, and I think for a lot of Americans, maybe it seems like, well, it's happening in Mexico, so it seems so far removed, but it's literally on the other side of the wall or the bridge from the U.S. So it really is, when you can see the U.S. from where, you know, these tent cities and these tent encampments are, so it's not far removed. You know, this is you absolutely U.S. policy and, you know, just a few yards away from U.S. territory, right. you know, where all these kids and, and families are waiting. Right. And you know, on that, it's been a year of this. It's been a year of these, you know, tent cities and people suffering, um, waiting for their chance to apply for asylum. What can people, our, our audience members, uh, anyone do to stand up and voice opposition to this policy? Like, what can we do to end this? Mm -hmm. I mean, the good thing about this is that this is just administrative policy. This can be turned around in a minute. Remember family separations? Remember when the administration said that they were going to do zero tolerance and thousands of kids were taken from their parents' arms, right? And then it was reversed with an executive order, right? Yeah. I mean, this is something that could be reversed immediately. So the same kind of 
you know, outreach and action and dialogue that was around family separation, we need to be doing this now around MPP. There needs to be pressure. There needs to be pressure on both sides of the aisle. People saying this is unacceptable. This is un-American. You know, people should not be put in life-threatening conditions. Children should not be separated from their family members just because they want to ask for protection. So, you know, we need to be speaking up just like we did about family separation. And hopefully we'll see the same reversal of policy when they understand that it's untenable that Americans won't stand for it. Well, thank you so much, Jen, for this overview. It was, it was really helpful to hear from you uh, and to to talk about all of this. Um, we will uh, continue to share all of the resources that um, we as kind get um, about this policy. Um, and we will also share in the comments some stories um, from some of our staff that our staff has written up uh, about the, the real life children and families that this policy is affecting. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, we will um, be sure to be in touch soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone.